started. This one's gonna be slightly more awkward than the last one um, because at some point I'm gonna have to try to move my camera around so y'all can see me actually write stuff, but we'll see how it goes. Welcome to Intro to Calligraphy. Uh, we are gonna be talking in this class about, uh, I'll just give an overview of what calligraphy is. And again, um, for some of you, this will be review, uh, but I'm, I'm starting with the assumption that you know nothing about this. <laughs> I'm going to talk a little bit about the development of different writing styles, and that might seem like kind of overly academic, but one, I am an academic, so, um, but more importantly, uh, I think understanding how these writing systems have developed over time helps you as a calligrapher um, understand why, like, why letters look the way they do. I will talk a little bit about the supplies that you need. We covered uh, some of the basics in the last class, but uh, obviously there's there's uh, some specific stuff in calligraphy that we'll get into. And uh, we'll, we'll get started trying a little bit. So if you um, are gonna try to, to write along with me, you will need something with a, some writing implement with a flat edge. Now that can be a calligraphy pen with a nib in it if you have those supplies. Uh, but you can also get started with a highlighter if you have one, a chisel edge highlighter. There you go. If you have a um, like a little dry erase board with dry erase markers that have that chisel edge, anything along those lines will at least help you kind of get the get the feel of it. So what is calligraphy? Without Googling it, what do you guys think calligraphy is? <laughs> It's the writing parts. It's the writing parts. Is it just writing? <laughs> it's the fancy writing? <laughs> it is the fancy writing, yeah. Um, so it's, it, as we say in the South, it's writing party. <laughs> and that's literally actually what the Greek means. <laughs> it's pretty writing. <laughs> uh, so we have kylos, which is uh, an early Greek word for beauty. Uh, graphene, I'm probably, I haven't, I don't speak Greek. I'm sure I'm mangling these pronunciations. Uh, uh, graphene writing, and then so calligraphia, um, beautiful writing. So it literally means write and party. Uh, OED defines cal calligraphy as uh, decorative handwriting or handwritten lettering. And uh, so that's the, the noun. And then um, it's also the art of producing those things. So, um, you know, I, I do calligraphy or I make calligraphy, uh, both of those forms work. You may have seen calligraphy in your everyday life. You see calligraphy all the time and don't realize it. We call them fonts now, but of course, uh, all of our modern fonts are derived in one way or another from historical handwriting forms. Uh, I think the, the most common example of a calligraphic form that we see in the modern world is uh, uh, newspaper mastheads, and in particular, the New York Times is such a great example of that. Um, this is a Gothic black letter hand. Um, you know, you could take this back in time, 600 years, 500 years, and people would be able to read it without any problem. Also used for other things. <laughs> and uh, you'll see other uh, other hands pop up as well. This is a, a picture from um, Mellow Mushroom in Mobile, Alabama, just across the street from where Heather works. Um, so you may have been there before. And uh, that's, a, that's a form of unseal hand in that particular. So I, I, there are obviously thousands of examples that we could use, but I just think it's interesting to, to see that even though we have moved on to mostly fonts that are derived from um, the printing age of writing, that we still do see these, these handwritten fonts or these, these fonts derived from handwriting um, showing up. Here are some examples of calligraphy on SCA scrolls. Uh, and these are all um, different ones that I have done. <laughs> so uh, you can, some, some, some folks specialize in just one hand. Um, some of us uh, masochistically decide to try to learn as many as we can. And uh, what's, we were talking in the last class about, you know, you can start a, a war <laughs> in scribal groups by going in and saying, hey, hey, you know, ink or hey, whatever. Um, uh, again, the, the, I don't think you could start a war with this, but I always find it really interesting to hear people talk about which hands they find easier than others and why, because they're very often opposite. Uh, so you will notice, for example, in the, the biggest example in the middle of the screen here um, is a very rounded hand. 
uh, and that is uh, an unseal hand. And it's my favorite because it's very rounded. It flows naturally for me, at least. I find that the letter forms easy to make, pleasing to make. I think it looks nice. Um, and so that is, is one of my faves. And then the last one, the bottom right there, that's a Gothic hand. And I hate Gothic. <laughs> it is my least favorite to do. Uh, maybe Roman rustic. Roman rustic might be my least favorite, but Gothic is definitely up there. Um, it, it, it cramps my hand. I don't like it, but you will find people who love Gothic because it's all straight lines. Um, so everybody's kind of got their, got their fave. But these are uh, just a, a small sample of the various ways that we can write on SCA scrolls. And, um, you know, just one of them isn't even, you know, uh, one that, that we would recognize now as writing because it's runes. Um, and, and we use runes on, on some scrolls as well. And I'm going to come back to these too. So a brief dive into history. It is, after all, what we do. Um, our modern um, calligraphic forms and, and, and our, our medieval calligraphic forms and our modern writing forms derive ultimately out of Greek capital writing, uh, which we see the first hints of um, very, very, very long ago, way before our common era. Um, uh, and there are, I, don't, I wanna emphasize here that there are other forms of writing going on at this time too, uh, and that there are other forms of writing that kind of fed into this. So I'm not deleting any of those, but if you wanna trace the progression, here's really where the progression starts, right? So, you know, our modern form of writing doesn't really look anything like Hebrew, for example, which is also active at this time. So we start with Greek capital writing. And um, again, it's, it's, it has survived more or less unchanged uh, to, to now. Um, you know, some, some of the letter forms have evolved over time, but you could take, you could write something in modern Greek and take it back to this time and, and they'd probably be able to figure it out. Greek capital writing um, leads to Roman capitals. And I'll show you what each of these look like here too in a minute. Roman capitals arise the sixth to fifth century uh, or sixth century before our common era to the fifth century afterwards. And these are, and again, these would be totally recognizable to you. Times New Roman is basically uh, saying, you know, all caps Times New Roman looks basically just like Roman capitals. So you see a lot of these uh, engraved um, on in stone. Um, and then uh, also in writing, but they're easier to engrave than they are to write. So we also start to see the use of Roman majuscules arise as a, a handwritten form of those capitals. And then that turns into minuscule as well. Quick note, majuscule and minuscule, what we now refer to as uppercase and lowercase letters. Uppercase and lowercase are printing terms. The uh, capital letters, the majuscules would, would literally the, the, the blocks that you would put into the printing press to actually, you know, once you print it on the paper, um, you know, you arrange all the blocks of the letters, the uppercase, the capital letters were kept in the upper half of the case, <laughs> and the lowercase ones were kept in the bottom half. So before that, we call them majuscule and minuscule. Unseal derives uh, out of, actually kind of bypasses a lot of the Roman stuff and derives out of the, the Greek writing. Uh, we see that mostly in fourth to eighth century in the common era. Um, and then again, evolves slightly into uh, a half unseal form. Though that in turn gives way to, or, or evolves into uh, Merovingian, Visigothic and, and Carolingian or what you'll sometimes see called Caroline writing. And that was um, uh, actually derived at the court of Charlemagne, Charles the Great, who uh, was like, y'all gotta stop writing in ways I can't understand. <laughs> Let's standardize this. <laughs> that evolves into kind of what we call proto-Gothic because it's not entirely Gothic yet, um, but uh, it's also slightly different from, from Caroline. Uh, you'll also see these sometimes referred to as transitional or book hands. Um, they're, uh, they're called book hands, I guess, mostly because they're faster to write than some of these other. Um, they're, they're more like what we would what modern handwriting looks like. And so when you have somebody who has to transcribe an entire freaking book, they want something that's going to be quick. That's going to lead into black letter or Gothic and all of its variants. Uh, we start to get into late period and, and I'm not, you, at this point things start to really diverge. I'm not going to name every hand 
out there because um, there, there's a lot of um, a lot of different uh, developments going on this time. We also, of course, see the rise of printing um, in this time as well, and so things start to splinter even more. Uh, as a result of printing, um, and as a result of some of the uh, the advances in writing technologies, we also we do see the development of italic or chancery styles of writing, which then um, lead into the pointed pen uh, styles of writing, Edwardian, for example, and Roman book hand, which goes straight into the printing. And so, of course, we still see those now. That's a lot of words. Let me show you what they look like. <laughs> some of the and some of these terms are, are different because I just grabbed this off of Wikipedia, but um, so what we see here is Trajan, which are those uh, Roman capitals. And again, if you think about like the, the big carved uh, arches in Rome or, or you know the stone tombs, um, and those, again, basically look exactly the same way they do today, except for uh, the fact that they didn't have a couple of letters that we do. They don't have the J, U, um, or uh, W, or X. Trajan leads to rustic, and as you can see that, that uh, that development there is, you know, comes from like, hey, it's really hard with a pen to make these letter forms um, and to make, you know, the thinness and thickness. And so you, you see people start to kind of make it a little more cursive looking, right? Um, Greek unseal develops out again of Greek and that and uh, rustic kind of lead to unseal, which is the dominant form of writing for, for about four centuries, starts to modify half unseal. You see these, um, Visigothic Lixel, ben, um, ben, ben, Beneventon and Carolingian all, you know, again, they, they just start, it starts to look like what we think of as handwriting. Um, and then things start to get much more formal, that proto-Gothic, uh, the Gothic textualis fractor, all of those black letters. And then again, it, it develops into that printing, the printing fonts that you see later on. And the reason, again, that I said that I spend so much time on this is one, I'm a big nerd about it. <laughs> And, but two, I think, you know, understanding kind of how these letter forms develop helps us as calligraphers because you can sort of be like, okay, like I understand why rustic is the way that it is because they were kind of trying to make these Trajan forms, but with a pen, right? And so, you know, just, um, so you, you wind up twisting your hand around a lot to write rustic, which is why I don't like it because it's a pain to write. Um, you know, and then again, those, those sort of middle period, uh, Benevent and Carolingian, um, you know, those are, arise because we need a standard style of writing and it needs to be easy to write. So the letter forms get simplified a lot. So going back to, to my SCA calligraphy examples, you can see this, this uh, development through some of these examples. So here's that Roman rustic. Again, you wind up having to twist your hand a lot to write it, to get those, those feet on there just the right way, um, which is why unseal is so much more fun to write because you do not have to twist your hand at all. <laughs> um, but you can see the kind of the, the way those letter forms start to develop into that unseal hand. Uh, rustic capitals, we think also led to the development of runes. So that's kind of a separate track. Um, you can see again, some similar letter forms, runes to, to uh, evolve kind of differently. Out of unseal, we see we start to get into that uh, Carolingian hand there, and again, it's you know some of the letter forms are similar, but you can see there start to be some differences, notably in like the ends where the L's are handled, some other um, the W's I think are different. So just you, again, it's it's kind of a shift overall. Um, welcome to you, Elioth or Elith. I'm not sure how to say it, but um, just so you know, I'm recording this, so if you don't want to be in the recording, you'll just want to keep your camera off. But if you don't mind being in the recording. Feel free to keep it on. <laughs> um, I include these are are pretty similar examples, but I do start to get kind of into the um, those transitional book hands in the second one. So we're starting to edge more towards a proto gothic hand. That's what we have here. So here's where things start to get a little pointier, right? So all of these earlier hands were very rounded. They flow very well out of the pens, and then in proto gothic you start to see some of those pen stops happen, right? So um, and some of the little points and things that start to show up on letters are a result of the way that your hand works to try to make these letters. And then the last example that we had on that slide was uh, our black letter or Gothic example. And again, very much in contrast to those earlier very flowy hands, 
this this one is very like it's you know it's all composed of, of little lines basically I just want to briefly mention a couple of other styles of calligraphy. These are not styles that I really know um, much, if anything, about. But uh, you know, I certainly don't want to imply that the, the, the writing is only evolving in, in Europe at this time. Um, East Asia developed writing uh, quite a lot earlier um, in, in terms of, and, and uh, we talked in the last class about uh, the development of paper, which made literacy and writing much more available, uh, as paper is a lot cheaper to, to produce and to keep than parchment is. Um, East Asian calligraphy is, uh, rather than using a, a reed pen or a quill pen, is uh, created using a brush. And it's more, uh, it began everywhere and still is in, in China, um, a logographic script. So rather than, for example, um, having letters that represent individual phonemes or the sounds that we make, um, you know, so, so in European languages, as long as you know how that language pronounces the alphabet, you can sound out pretty much any word. English is sometimes a butt about it because <laughs> we grab uh, words from a lot of different languages. But um, but in the for, you know for the most part, if if you know that in the English language a ah, you know a usually makes an a ah sound, um, then you can you know if given a word, you can sound it out right. Uh, in East Asian script. Um, characters correspond to meaningful units of language, which is a really vague way of saying uh, that it's much more context driven and it's not based on sound. Um, so you might have a character that uh, technically would translate as house, but if it's used in conjunction with different characters, that the meaning of that one character changes. So if it's, you know, if you put this character with it, it means house. If you put this character with it, it means security or whatever. And I'm just, I, I don't know Chinese, I'm making these up, but that's the idea <laughs> there, right? Um, unlike uh, Western languages, which are written um, horizontally from left to right, um, East Asian languages are traditionally written in vertical columns from right to left. So again, as you can see that, you know, we, we start to, it, it, it's a different way of thinking, it's a different way of designing documents. Um, and uh, the advent of modern computers has meant that they've had to, you know, completely rethink that the, the way these languages are structured in order to be able to to use uh, modern fonts and computing and stuff. So it has been fascinating. Uh, in terms of the development of the characters, uh, we we first know of um, the characters that are largely still in, in modern usage. Um, the first example we have is is from 1400, before the Common Era, but um, we, we think they were around quite a long time before then. And by the, the first century of the common era, again, the, 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 the language, the, the alphabet, whatever you want to call it, the character set is, uh, is pretty well set. Uh, Chinese characters were adopted in Korea around the fourth century of the common era. Um, there's a whole other development that's happened there where um, Korean language now is uh, much more based on um, phonemes than it used to be. So, uh, you know, they adopted the characters, but they basically adapted the characters to their language. And so it doesn't work the same way that it does in, in China. Uh, and then the same thing in Japan, right? Japan adopted Chinese characters, but simplified them down a lot and, and changed the way that they, uh, that they operate. And again, I just include this because I think it's, it's really fascinating to see how different modes of thought and how different modes of communication both affect writing and are affected by them. Um, so as I said, you know, the fact that that uh, paper and ink were, were relatively cheap in East Asia as compared to to Europe for most of its development meant that we can have 4000 characters that mean different things in a language. We don't have to be economical in our language. We can write as much as we want to versus in Europe where it's like <laughs> parchment is really expensive and takes a long time to make. Let's come up with 20 characters and make all of our words out of them. <laughs> Uh, another style of calligraphy that I think is wonderful but know almost nothing about is uh, Arabic or, uh, or Islamic calligraphy. Um, the photo on the, or the picture on the right, left, sorry, left there, <laughs> um, the, the five lines of writing are uh, five different styles of calligraphy um, in uh, the Arabic language. And so they have styles that are sort of for everyday language and they have ones that are um, basically only used to copy the Quran. 
uh, and that sort of thing. Um, and again, I, I don't know very much about it and, and hope to learn at some point because it is quite lovely. The second picture there is an example of what's called the teardrop style of Islamic calligraphy. And if you were uh, here for the first class, you saw me show an example of one of Mara's scrolls that had the calligraphy bent into little bird shapes. Um, and that's uh, sort of evocative of what's going on. This, this is a whole sentence, I think, that's just been kind of rearranged to fit into this, this shape, which is cool. And you'll also see uh, Arabic calligraphy woven into other art forms. This is a, a pottery bowl that has uh, an, early, uh, an earlier form of Arabic calligraphy around the edge. And so you see they, they've done those very swoopy tails to kind of make it part of the design of the bowl. And I don't know what it says, maybe it says cereal goes here, but um, <laughs> it says something. So I just think that's neat. Like I said, I, there um, much more uh, consideration of calligraphy as an art form in and of itself, rather than just as a mode of writing. So we see uh, three basic types of calligraphy nowadays, brush calligraphy, which of course began um, as a way to render East Asian characters, but now you see all of the live, laugh, love uh, <laughs> style of, of uh, writing that's uh, rendered as brush calligraphy. Um, pointed pen calligraphy, I alluded to earlier. Um, we haven't really talked about it because it's post period for the SCA, but all of the very sort of swoopy, um, uh, scripts that you see kind of in the 17th, 18th, 19th century, where um, you know the, the letters are very long and parts of them are thick and parts are very thin. Those are usually rendered with pointed pens, um, which respond to pressure. So when you push down on them, more ink comes out. When you let up, less ink comes out. And that's how those letters are formed. What we do in the SCA typically is broad edge or flat calligraphy. And that comes out of that tradition of using a quill or a reed pen that would have a flat end on it. So if you're interested in getting started in the SCA, I want to throw some resources at you here real quick. Um, I love the Calligrapher's Bible. There we go, <laughs> by David Harris. Uh, it is a small book, so it can fit in your take to events kit when we get to leave and go to events again. Um, it's also spiral bound, so it will lie flat. And it has a hundred different cheat sheets basically for hands in it. Now they're not all, some of them are modern. Um, oh, copper plate, this is what I was talking about earlier with some of those pointed pen ones. If y'all can see those very swoopy styles. Um, so uh, they're not all medieval, but about half of them are. And it's just really nice to kind of have everything laid out on a single page for you. And then on the other page, he shows you how to make, how to actually do some of the forms. So if you were only gonna buy one book, um, I would say, I recommend this one. And again, this is something that would probably start wars in various scribal groups, but um, I just think it's handy as a starter guide. And I, I still take it with me to events. If I'm like, how, does, how is that S made again? I can look it up real quick. Uh, Harris also has a much longer book called The Art of Calligraphy. Um, this is available online as a PDF. Um, it should be pretty easy to find. And if you can't find it, um, you can, I probably have a copy of it somewhere. <laughs> um, but definitely if you contact um, Mara over in the, the Meridia scribe group, I know she's got a copy line. There may actually even be one in the files of that group. But like I said, it's, it's fairly easy to find, I think. Um, the Drogon text is, an, is a really great one. If you were only going to buy two books, I'd say the Bible and medieval calligraphy here, um, because uh, this one actually focuses specifically on medieval hands and it has a lot of those um, in between hands, and again, he shows you like how to actually make the individual forms. So it's very good. Uh, this is Mara's site. Um, and Mistress Mara is a, a calligraphy and illumination laurel in Meridies, for those of you who aren't familiar with her. Uh, and she's got a lot of, of really cool information on her site. And if you want um, uh, handouts like the beginning calligraphy or like getting started with materials and layout and stuff, um, she's got those on her site as well. And some of the material I have in this presentation actually came from her. And then for those of us in Trimeris, the Trimeris Scribes Handbook, of course, a great resource. Um, most kingdoms have some kind of handbook, whether it's a, an actual like PDF or, or whether in the case of Meridians, a lot of that stuff is just on the um, Meridian Scribes uh, webpage. So uh, whatever kingdom you're in, usually your, your local scribal, your kingdom scribal group will have some kind of handbook. And if not, 
you're welcome to pilfer others. We, you know, every, <laughs> I, I mean, we all use material from, from other kingdoms and, and stuff. So I've, I've gone to other kingdoms handbooks for wording. If I need a scribe, a scroll wording that starts with a particular letter, for example. So supplies to get started. If you are getting started in calligraphy and you're not starting, I'm assuming here that you're not starting with a cartridge pen, which you are welcome to start with. But um, we recommend starting with a dip pen um, in general. And here's why. And I resisted this for a really long time, but I have come to understand the recommendation. Learning to write calligraphy with a modern implement will not teach you period writing styles. Modern implements are a lot more forgiving of the ways that you write letters. You can push ink with modern pens in a way that you can't if you're using um, a dip pen. That makes the writing faster. So if you are just trying to churn out a bunch of calligraphy on a bunch of AOAs, by all means. And we all, I mean, I still use cartridge pens. Mara still uses cartridge, pen, cartridge pens. Um, you know, there's nothing necessarily wrong with them. But if you want to learn calligraphy and you really want to learn, um, you know, how these hands developed and why they developed the way they did, then a, a dip pen is going to be the way to do that. So it's up to you whether you just are like, I just want to write pretty, get a cartridge pen, they're great. Um, but if you really want to learn the calligraphy, dip pen. So a nib holder, I have a couple of different examples here. Um, these are available on, I'm trying to put them in front of me, so they don't disappear into the background. Uh, uh, nib holders are available, uh, you, I mean, you can get them at Michael's, you can get them, I think Walmart still sells them. Um, you can certainly get them on um, John Neal booksellers. Uh, some people, this one was made uh, by Duke Thomas. It's a hand turned um, nib holder. And they're gonna have in the end, I don't know if you can quite see, there's a little metal bit. It's kind of a three part thing. And that's what, the, um, that's what holds your nibs in when you put them in. This is a little plastic one. It's, I like it because it's triangular, so it, fits in my hand nicely. I think you can see the metal bits in that one a little easier. You're also going to need nibs. Nibs. Man, I should have put, if anybody watches Brooklyn Nine-Nine, there's an episode where Terry gets addicted to um, cocoa nibs. I should have put that clip in here I have it for next time. Uh, so nibs are the part that you actually write with. And again, there's a lot of different types, but they're all going to look eh, kind of similar to this. Um, I'm holding it so that the writing part is up. So the actual bit that you write with is, is the top here. Um, and I'm not good at cleaning my nibs. So they all have like caked on bits of ink and stuff. Don't be me. Clean your nibs. Uh, nibs come in different widths. And unfortunately, they are not consistent across brands. So a number three nib. And browse doesn't mean anything when you are looking at other nib brands. It's a colossal pain in the butt. So you just kind of have to work with it. Um, everybody's got their favorite brands. Everybody's got their favorite styles. Um, sometimes you just kind of have to, best way to clean the nibs, <laughs> somebody tell me, I don't know. Uh, don't let the ink dry on them like I do, I'm lazy. <laughs> clean them with soap and water and let them, you know, dry them off. Um, there's, you can buy like, you know, various cleaning formulas and stuff and soap and water works just fine. I just, you know, half the time I finish a calligraphy project and I'm like, I'm done. And I just put my pen down and walk away <laughs> and let it get all gross. Um, so uh, everybody's kind of got their favorite brand of nibs. Some of them are firmer than others. All of them are going to give out eventually. Like you can't use nibs forever because they, they eventually will bend, they'll, you know, they'll, they'll get more and more flexible. Um, and so they'll start letting more ink through. Uh, but um, some of them browse or are firmer, they last a little longer. I don't like them personally. I don't bend down quite as much on, on them as, as you need to. So if you're gonna get started with this, I recommend just kind of buying a couple of each and trying them out. They're fairly cheap. They're usually under $2 each. So they're not, you know, you could get started with two of each of the major brands for 10 or 12 bucks. Uh, reservoirs. Reservoirs fit either underneath or on top of the nib. I'm holding up one right here. It's kind of hard to see. Um, and they hold more ink in them. If I can get it to. 
um, most of the time, if you if you buy nibs, they'll come with reservoirs. Sometimes some companies sell them separately. Uh, I take them off immediately. I don't. I'd rather. Ellen says Dawn soap and a fingernail brush to clean your nibs. So that's that sounds great. I should do that. <laughs> um, I'm not the kind of person who who thinks ahead like that. Uh, so reservoirs hold more ink. Um, and again, that's kind of a personal preference. I don't like having that much ink because I always manage to screw it up. So I would rather just have to dip more often. And you can take reservoirs off of some nibs and put the, some people like cobble together Franken pens out of different styles. You will need ink, of course, of some kind. Um, Windsor Newton makes some nice calligraphy inks. Um, Dr. PH Martin, again, basically anything you can find in Michael's, Dick Blick, any of the, you know, is fine. I like, I found this uh, traditional, uh, ostensibly traditional Chinese ink on sale once. Uh, I was like, I'll try that. It, I think I've only used a third of it and I've been using it nonstop for two years. So <laughs> ink lasts a while. Um, paper. Now we talked in the last class about different types of paper. Um, in the SCA Bristol board is your standard. Um, it's thick. Um, it's a little thicker than, than standard cardstock. It's very smooth. It's optimized for writing and drawing on. So it's, um, it, it's really, really great to, to get started with. Uh, if you're going to practice calligraphy, do not practice. Buy some decent paper, even if it's not Bristol. Get something um, like a, a good cardstock or something to practice on. If you practice on um, printer paper, you're, you're just going to get frustrated. <laughs> Um, if you're using dip pens for for cartridge pens, it's it's not as bad because those are um, the ink those use are better for for regular paper. But um, the ends of your nibs will chew up um, copy paper or printer paper, and it'll clog them up, and you'll just get really frustrated. Um, so I've been holding nibs up to the screen, but here's a, a picture of one real quick. This is a pointed pen nib, so this is again not the style that we use. In, uh, in most work in the SCA, but it's the picture I found on Wiki. So there we go. Um, so in the, uh, so you, of course you have your holder and then the nib itself. Um, so you have the two tines, there's a slit right in the middle. Um, and, you can, and maybe where's, I don't know if you can see the slit in this one, but um, the slit is what kind of draws the ink down to the end. And then the tines are what spread it onto the paper. So for pointed pen, that's, they're very flexible. And again, if you, if you press down on it, they spread apart and you'll see more ink flow. Um, with broad edge nibs, they're less flexible, but it still works in the same principle. And then again, a reservoir if you want one. So how this actually works, oh, sorry, before we get into this, questions about basics of supplies and that kind of stuff. I know I'm sort of rolling through this pretty quickly because I do want to get to actually making some letters if we can. All right. Uh, can we have access to your PowerPoint? Yes, I will post the slides, um, and I will I'll post them in the event for this uh, the heraldic scribal event on Facebook. I'll put um, I'll put links there, and I'll put them in the Trimaris Scribes group as well. So um, here's where we get into the part where people are like, I, I don't think I could do calligraphy because I, I have messy handwriting or like, I don't, I don't write well. Um, the great part is the pen does so much of the work for you. If you have that flat edge on your pen, um, you know, in terms of the, the ways that the letters look, the style, uh, the pen really does a lot of that work. And here's how, um, kind of how that works. You, you hold your pen at an angle to the paper. And I don't mean an angle this way, I mean an angle this way, right? And that angle, again, is how those letters wind up looking the way that they do. So if you are drawing one way, it's a thick line. And if you're drawing another way, it's a thin line because you're only using the edge of the pen. And this is what I meant earlier when I said that um, modern cartridge pens will let you push ink. So, you know, we've all learned to write using pencils and ballpoint pens. And it doesn't matter in those cases what, what direction you're writing in, right? it's the same ink, the ink is flowing no matter what, or the, the graphite is coming off the pencil no matter what. But with um, uh, medieval calligraphy, you would pull the ink across the page. And if you try to push it, that sharp edge of your pen is gonna get caught up. 
So that's why a lot of the letter forms involve maybe multiple strokes in some cases. So, you know, we would write an A in multiple, in modern times, just like A, but um, because that involves pushing ink in medieval times, they would do A, pick up the pen and then pull the ink down again. And I'll show you what I mean by that in, in a minute when we get to the demo, but I just wanted to uh, kind of clarify that from earlier. So the pen does a lot of work for you. And just even practicing these basic strokes can help you a lot in terms of uh, thinking about calligraphy. The biggest thing that helped me really get into calligraphy, and I was doing calligraphy even before I wound up in the SCA, I don't have neat handwriting. Like I can if I need to, but my everyday handwriting is garbage. Um, and the same is true for a lot of us. If that's the case for you and you're stressed out about thinking about calligraphy as writing, don't think of it as writing, it's not. Calligraphy is drawing letters. Right? So don't think about, I am writing this word. Think about, I am drawing this A. And, and so you know, your modern habits of writing, you know, cursive or whatever you've been trained in, don't apply here. You're, you're making shapes and you're joining them together to make letters and you're writing letters next to each other. You're drawing letters next to each other to make words. So changing the angle of your pen, um, different hands will have different angles. That you, the, um, so you'll see some of them have those, those really thick backstrokes and some of them have thinner ones because the angle's different. This is all kind of detailed stuff. <clears throat> Ratios matter too. Um, this is something I, I'm probably not gonna be great at teaching. If you have questions about it, sorry, because I don't draw ratio lines and stuff when I collect, I just kind of do it by eye, I guess. You know, the same way some people can play music by ear, I can just kind of eyeball ratios. Um, so, but this is this is what uh, is meant by ratios. Different hands have different, um, you know, the capital letters are X percent larger than the lowercase, for example. And then the, the lower pieces on G's and Y's and things go X percent down. Um, so you'll see a lot of hands, especially if you, if you look at like the Harris book uh, or whatever, you know, let's say that this is a two, five, two ratio or something like that. Okay. So the middle part of the letter, the main part of the letter, you know, the A's and the, the tops of the P and G here, for example, maybe that's five nitwits. And then the ascenders, the part that go above are two and the descenders are two. Um, you know, some people that really mathematical approach works for you. And if, if that's you, fantastic. Um, as I said, I, I get more stressed if I draw a bunch of lines and try to make my letters fit in them. I, I, it always just looks better if I do it by hand, so. So again, calligraphy is all about finding the approach that works for you. There's no one right or wrong way to do any of this. If you want to practice using um, ratio lines, there uh, Mara has a printable on her page that is, uh, um, it's a one to one to 2.5 to one to one. <laughs> um, and what that basically means is that the, the main part of the letter uh, is two and a half nib widths and then it's one above and one below for those ascenders and descenders. Um, so she's got that on her page. You can print that out. As I said, um, you know, if you just wanna print it out on printer paper and start working with a pencil or a highlighter or something that's gonna work uh, well on paper, you can. But if you wanna start actually working with a dip pen, I would recommend cardstock or Bristol. So let me show you what I mean. I'm gonna kind of rearrange my desk here for a second. I'm gonna show you uh, when I was talking about the fact that um, calligraphy is really about drawing letters more so than it is about writing. Uh, I'm gonna show you what I mean by that. And it's, there are, you can reduce most calligraphic alphabets down to, um, a series of particular shapes. And if you master those shapes, you can assemble those in different ways into different letters. And I kind of, you know, once I started learning this stuff, I kind of wish we taught modern writing that way too. You know, it, when we're taught to write in elementary school, we're taught to form individual letters. And it's not, you know, it's like, this is what an A looks like. This is what a B looks like. This is what a C looks like. And we don't really get a lot of like, an A is made of a circle and a stick and a B is made of a circle and a stick. The stick is just taller. <laughs> Um, but unseal in particular is a great one to start with because most of the letters are the same height. 
There's only a few ascenders and descenders. And although you can write it with capitals, most of the time we don't. You'll also note on the screen there that I had that there's uh, some variation in the ways that these letters are formed, right? So um, I'm going to cut my video off here for a second, but I'm going to keep talking while I try to get this um, set up. There's some variation, so uh, you know, again, people I think get stressed, and I know I did when I got started um, about like trying to, you know, oh, I have to make these letters exactly this way. No, you don't. <laughs> And medieval people didn't either. So, uh, you know, if you can, I just worked out last night about how I was gonna do this and I have to remember how I made it work. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, if, if, the, if the D in the, um, the unseal alphabet on the left hand of the screen here, that D with the, the swoop going over, that gives a lot of people a lot of trouble. Don't use that one, use the D in the other one, <laughs> right? Um, so there's again, you know, everybody kind of did these these things differently in period, and we're certainly within our rights to take that approach as well. Oh, that's not going to work. That's going to hit me in the face. <laughs> All right. Sorry, guys. One more second. That's better. Focus. Come on. Hopefully that will work. <laughs> All right. Some ink together. Get some nibs together. I'm trying to find one of my fat nibs so it'll show up. <laughs> It's called a dinky dip. I don't remember if I talked about it in this class. Um, it's a little, little teeny tiny plastic container. It's really nice for portioning out a small amount of ink for a project, or if you want to share ink with somebody, you can do it with one of these too. All right. I'm gonna stop this screen share. And I want to. So let's just take unseal for example. Um, so we have, come on, and ink flow is a thing. <laughs> That's where I get for again, letting my nibs get gross. Let's see if I can mirror that, hold on. That's more readable. Okay. Wait, did it mirror it for you guys or no? It's correct on our screen. Like it's correct on yours. Yeah. Still backwards for me. That is weird. Whatever. As long as it's correct on yours. <laughs> so what we can see in this particular case, and sorry, it keeps kind of focusing in and out. Like I said, it's um, is that we have two shapes going on here. And in fact, the the swoop here on along the um, whatever the spine, I guess, of the A is a shape that we see in some other letters. For example, N. And now with N, we've gone in and added a couple more shapes, right? We've added this one, which we can extend to make into a J. And of course, they didn't have J. We've invented this for our modern <laughs> way of writing. Many of us have J names, so we appreciate the addition of a J. Um, we can take our spoop. And we can add some, oops, it's kind of gross. We can add a butt to it and we can make it a B. Let's try, 
What else haven't we done? <laughs> An actual alphabet. I'm not caffeinated enough for this. <laughs> Um, and some, you know, and again, the specific letter forms you follow here are going to depend a lot on, you know, what, what source you're using and kind of what, you know, what you learn. Uh, again, the D is one. So we have a, here's a curve that can be a C or it can be an O. And, and you see here how I'm doing it as two strokes again, and that's because of that, the way that, that the ink works on a dip pen. If you were using a, a modern pen, for those of you who are, are playing around with a highlighter or something like that, yeah, you can go ahead and do that as one stroke, but what you're doing is you're pushing ink up the backstroke there, and it's much harder to do with, um, with a nib, and again, you, you just learn less about how those letters are formed. So doing it as two strokes there allows you to actually practice and make it look nicer. And in fact, if I had tried to do that on parchment, that pushing the ink up there probably wouldn't have worked at all. Bristol just is a little more forgiving. So other, so we can use our same swoop and we can do, add a little blurp and make it a D. And I like this D better than um, the D that you'll see in a lot of versions of Unseal because I always wind up like having to go back and connect things and this part winds up looking weird and I don't know. So I like this whoopy D, but maybe you like this D better and that's fine. Again, you can kind of mix and match. Um, and if you look at extant examples, you won't see one exact same hand being used for all of them. You'll see those individual variations. For example, for an A, you might have the sort of fat A that I've got here, or you might see something like that. Come on. Why? I do not want to focus. There we go. Um, so again, you see that those sorts of variations, and you can play around with what works for you. Um, rather than our pointy N, you might, uh, this, this is another one that we're going to use a lot, by the way, this sort of, I'm not really controlling my ink very well. That's an I, it can be an L, it can be the start of a different type of N. <laughs> we can go back to our swoopy line here. And we can make a P. I didn't do that well. Hang on. Ignore that. Bad P. No biscuit. So there's a, another um, little bit that we need. Um, we can use it to make a P. We can use it to make an F. We can add this little tail to our P. And make an R. So you see, again, it's less about how do I learn how to write this specific letter and more about um, how do I combine these pen strokes. And, and again, this is about efficiency, right? For, for these monks um, and these, these folks who are writing there's Master Barrar, the paper maker. Um, so for the folks who are, uh, you know, copying these things over and over and over again, um, you can see that they would have wanted to develop the most efficient way of putting these letters together. And so they're going to reuse a lot of these strokes. So really, if you can, you know, master a couple of straight lines, a few swoops, we've got a, you know, forward swoop and a backward swoop. Um, we've got our diagonal swoop. Uh, what else haven't we done? So um, M's are a little weird. M M's are actually a combination of three. So we have our forward swoop. We have our line. And we have our backward swoop. 
M's can be a little difficult to master. Um, because you wind up with one half fatter than the other or whatever. So again, you know, if you want to start off with a more basic M, you can do it. And this, we see this form show up in, in some types of writing. This one is more often used, but this is perfectly fine. And you can add a little to the end if you want to <laughs> make it look even nicer. So, um, yeah, you know, unfortunately, if, if we were doing this in person, I could come around and kind of help you individually and, and you know, show you show you ways to to work with the lettering. This is kind of the best I can do in this circumstance. But, you know, my advice is definitely just uh, explore different writing styles. Um, as I said, I, I like to start with Unseal for beginner colleague because, um, one, it really can be reduced down to just those. Hang on, let me, I'm going to. See if I can make this bigger. I'm going to unspotlight me for a second. Cal, you want to hold that up again? Nice. Yeah. So um, it, it's it's terrible highlighter calligraphy, but it's something. <laughs> I mean, it's you know, practice is is really where it's at. And you notice again that I haven't gone through. I've just drawn my my lines, but I haven't drawn like ascender and descender lines because I just don't typically work with them. But you could draw. You know, if you wanted to to work on that, you would draw, you know, a, a descender line kind of here and an S underline here. Um, but, you know, finding a hand that works for you, um, as I said, I, I like Unseal because you can reduce it down to the strokes and also because it just kind of looks more medieval than some of the other ones. So, you know, in terms of, of comparing to modern handwriting, um, I think uh, Carolingian and um, I am blanking on the name of it. It's a much later period one. I can't remember the name off the top of my head, but it um, it's one of the ones that comes out of, that's simplified out for for printing. It is a handwriting, but it's it, it looks um, much more like printing. Um, and so those two, I think, are much closer to our modern hands. But I feel like learning them is less um, satisfying because you're like, okay, I learned how to write again. <laughs> Whereas if you learn Unseal, you're like, hey, I made something that looks medieval. Um, so that's why I like to start with it. But again, you know, find whatever works for you. When you get to the later fonts as well, or the later hands, um, we'll wrap up here in, in one minute. Um, so, you know, even Gothic hands, for example, which look really complicated to write, and they are, um, but they're, they're still combinations of like, I'm just gonna, you know, like, here's a long line, here's a shorter line, here's a, you know, there's still combinations of the same elements, right? And so again, if you just learn those few strokes, you can combine them into the letters uh, in, in, you know, in different ways. As I said, I don't like Gothic. It hurts my hand, but I like, I like Unseal. So that's uh, unfortunately all we have for time. Um, our next, the next class is, is about to get started here. Uh, I hope to have time for more questions, but I spent too much time talking about history. So. so I have some links, Jessica, if you don't mind. Please, please post those links. That would be fantastic. Okay, so I am posting there should be five links going into the chat right now. Um, you can save the chat if you weren't in the first class by going to the bottom of the chat panel. By the word file, you will see three dots. Click those three dots. It will give you the opportunity to save the chat. And I just posted a PDF link to um, two different scribal books and a couple of Facebook groups and a website. Fantastic. Thank you, Ellen. That's awesome. All right, I will stop the recording, but um, stick around for more scribal action in this channel. And of course, there's a couple of other other channels happening too. So um, thank you all very much for being here. It's my first time teaching intro colleague and uh, I, I had a good time. <laughs>